Jonathan, great to see you again. Yeah, it's good to see you again, David. So just a little bit of backstory. We've been putting out a few pieces recently with Brett Weinstein. Uh, a lot to do with his discussion with Richard Dawkins in Chicago, where he, I think the consensus is that he certainly challenged Dawkins pretty um, solidly on his sort of new atheist dismissal of religion. A lot of people seem to have been persuaded by that. And then another couple of pieces as well, where he was reflecting on the Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson debates. I'm really interested. So after, after that, you got in touch with me to say, Let's catch up, because I know we both think that this conversation is really, really important. And why, why did you get in touch? What, what, what did you feel sort of watching those, Brett, those interviews with Brett? Well, I think that the, uh, I think it's very, in a way, I'm very happy that that discussion with Dawkins happened. But I think I'm left kind of a bit, I would say, fr not frustrated or feeling like this isn't going far enough. And um, the sense that I get from Brett, because I listened to the interviews that you did with him, is the same impression that I got when I had a discussion with him in Vancouver about was it a year and a half ago now, um, is that he views religion, let's say, as a series of heuristic formulations, like you could call them rules, that if you follow them, then you have a better chance to survive, let's say. But I think what's missing is to understand just how deep religion, what religion is addressing is not so much a bunch of rules, but is rather structural. That is, it is, it is representing the very structure of reality in the manner in which consciousness engages with reality. And so it's a far deeper issue that we're dealing with. Um, and so when I hear Brett saying things like, you know, we can't rely on these old texts because you know, they're outdated and they talk about things that aren't relevant. It's because he's looking at the surface rules. He's looking at the surface details, but he's not looking at the, the patterns of behavior and the patterns in the stories and in the rituals, which are there to rather do things like establish space, establish time, establish hierarchy, establish our relationships to others within a, a, a unity. And so all of that is really what religion is dealing with. I guess you'd, you'd, agree that he's going further than someone like Sam Harris was, for example? I think so. I think that Brett is able to see at least the utility of religion, or at least the utility that religion, religion has had in the past. And so that's kind of something that he wants to offer up to religious people, hoping in a way that then religious people will feel less offended by uh, evolutionary theory. Um, so I think that in a way he's kind of lending a handout, but there's something in the way that he lends his handout that's also kind of condescending because he's saying, you know, religion is this, but people who have thought deeply about, and some people do think that it's true. If you meet some common person on the street, uh, they might think some, those types of things about religion, just like if you ask them about evolution, they'll have silly ideas about evolution. Uh, the problem is that religion isn't, isn't de democratic. There's something that is kind of the patterns in them, uh, although they can be discussed, are rather stable. Um, and so I always get the feeling like, no, you're not, you're not dealing with what it's really about, which is this more structural element of, of human consciousness. Because what's really interesting is you posted on Facebook a clip from Jordan Peterson. He was on the Dave Rubin show quite recently with Ben Shapiro. And it was a, it's a brilliant clip, and I'm going to play it in a second. Um, I think it's about five minutes or so, where he talks about it's as if there's a structure underlying being. And it's, it's a brilliant enunciation of, of, of sort of a religious understanding of, of the world. And you posted it, and I think you said something like, wow, he goes deeper than he's ever gone before, or something like that. And I sent it to Brett, because I talked to Brett quite a lot about these questions on and off camera in Portland, and said, what do you make of this? And Brett pretty much said, yeah, I completely agree. Jordan is pretty much supporting my position on this. And so this is really fascinating that you both had such a strong reaction or a, a, a different reaction to the, exactly the same piece. Let's play it now, and then we'll pick up off the back of that. Well, so here's, here's the idea. And, and it, it bears on your question, although I don't exactly know how. It's as if there's a spirit at the bottom of things that is, that is involved in the, in, the, in the bringing to being of everything. So, like, so, for example, people talk about evolution as a random process, but that's not true. It's not true. 
the mutations are random. But there's also a lot of sources, other sources of genetic <coughs> variation. But the selection mechanisms are not random. So now then the question is, what are the selection mechanisms? So I'm going to have to go a bunch of places. <laughs> Survival mostly, well, but, I think. Well, here's yeah. one selection mechanism. Yeah. It's like, so s human females are very sexually selective. That's why you have twice as many female ancestors as male ancestors. So the male failure rate for reproduction is twice that of the females. Uh. Okay, so the question is, well, how is it that males succeed differentially? And the first answer is, well, females reject, if human females reject. But then the question might be, well, they reject on the basis of what? And the answer is, well, it's something like competence. And then the question is, well, how is competence defined? And then the answer to that is, well, men put themselves in hierarchies and they vote on each other's competence. And it's really counterintuitive in some sense from an evolutionary perspective because you'd have to ask yourself why would men put themselves in positions where they elevate some men in status mm -hmm. and then give them a huge reproductive advantage given that that's to their reproductive disadvantage in, in some sense. Okay, and there are reasons. For, part of that might be, well, let's say you decide to follow the best leader in a battle. Well, then you don't die. Like, he might get all the women, but you don't die, so at least you're still in the game. Yeah. And it might be the same if you're following the greatest hunter. And the greatest hunter wouldn't be the person who was best at bringing down the game. It would be the person who was best at bringing down the game and sharing it and organizing the next hunt and all of that, mm -hmm. right? And so men will organize themselves into groups and privilege certain men, and that puts them ahead in the reproductive hierarchy. And so what that means to some degree is that there's a, a spirit of masculinity that's shaping the entire structure of human evolutionary history. That's what that means. Mm -hmm. And then I think, okay, well, that might just be a biological epiphenomenon. And so it would be a spirit that, it's the spirit of positive masculinity that manifests itself across epochal ages, millions of years perhaps, and it actually has shaped our consciousness, actually. And so you can think about that as a figure, and it would be the figure that emerges, it's like, it's like the, it's like this, it's like the essential spirit of all the great men who defined what greatness constituted. That's a spirit. Okay, now that's a purely biological explanation. Mm -hmm. You could say, well, that's God for all intents and purposes. You might have an image of that built right into you. Even the sense that you can experience something divine and paternal might be merely a reflection of that evolutionary process. So that would be a biologically reductive argument mm -hmm. for the existence of what we experience as God. But then there's another possibility too, which is that that's actually reflective of a deeper metaphysical reality that has to do with the nature of consciousness itself. And I would say that I think that's true, is I believe the biological case, and I believe the biologically reductive case, but I don't think that exhausts it. I think that there's a metaphysical layer underneath that that the, bio that the biology is a genuine reflection of. And that's the sort of the macrocosm above and the microcosm below. That, yeah. we, that we are really reflective, including in our consciousness, of something about the structure of reality itself. And that might involve whatever, whatever it is that God is. I think that in the discussion that's been ha that's been going along with Jordan and uh, the New Atheists and Jordan, you know, based on discussions that I have it privately with him, uh, I felt like this is something that he had never really said in public, which he had enunciated in private, things that he was trying to uh, deal with, which is that he's been able to build this bottom up case for, let's say, the structures of religion or the idea of deities or the or the notion of of the. Uh, the Heavenly Father, let's say, he's been able to build it up and, and explain quite well how, you know, uh, certain biological processes will lead to this, this formulation or to these images. Um, but what he hasn't done so much and what he was doing th there is to say, the reason why those patterns brought about these images in the first place is because they necessarily have to be a representation of reality itself or at the reality to the extent that we can engage with it. And so the notion is that the reason why this image is pops up and comes up bottom up is because it is participating in the, the structure of reality itself. And so the image of, 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 deity, of deities or of, of, of God or of the transcendent, they are capturing something about the manner in which reality works itself. So that's why when we engage in those patterns, in those structures, that's why they then become a, a way to make, uh, let's say it's for humanity to thrive or for the human species to, to continue. I don't know if that makes sense.
Well, I mean, the, the question that comes up, I guess, is it, that that may be true. And I think, I think in that he also says that the danger here is that you're explaining religion versus explaining religion away. And I think Jordan in that clip says something about you can explain it this way. It is a pattern of being that doesn't exhaust the possibility that there's a metaphysical structure or there's a metaphysical aspect to it as well. And I guess... Right. But the idea is that why is there this pattern of being? That's what we got kind of come back to is that why does reality lay itself out this way? Why does, and, and he, he hits the nail right at the right place, which is he talks about how it's basically the structure of consciousness. So this hierarchy, the, 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 this hierarchy that he sets up is the structure of consciousness. And so that's why there are analogies, let's say, between the hierarchy he sets up in terms of this idea of the spirit of the father, which kind of rises up and manifests itself as this transcendent father. And also it's, an, it's analogous to the idea of space, which is, you know, you create a center of space and then you lay out a space around it. The notion of a center of time around which a cycle will, will then proceed. And so all these are, are a cent the center of a community in terms of a chief or in terms of, a, of an ideal that everybody gathers around and creates unity around this, this thing that is above them. Um, and so th this idea is that the reason why this is, is because it's the shape of consciousness and consciousness becomes the analogy to the structure of, of the cosmos itself or, this, or the way in which we interact with what causes the universe to exist. Uh, it, it, the idea is that the pattern is not arbitrary. It, it, has, it's not, it, it could not have been in another way. It, that's the pattern of reality. But I mean, I guess I can follow you up to a point. My, what I'm wondering about is why is that specifically Christian in, in that sense? Would you no, argue? It's not, it's not specifically not. Christian. It's mm. not specifically Christian. It all, I think that all religions are addressing this mystery, are dealing with this mystery in a way. That's why there are so many analogies in, in all the different religions. That's why, you know, for example, this idea of centered space, this notion of centered time, the idea of rituals of establishment are there in, in all religions. Um, I think that in terms of Christianity, what it, let's say what it has offered is the, let's say the, this point or this, this bringing it all together in the, you know, in the person of Christ, but doing that in a manner which also brings it back into us, which, you know, St. Paul talks about Christ in us, that, that's, that, that Christ has revealed to us the mystery hidden from the beginning of time, which is Christ in you. And so Christ also brings it into the, the person. And, and so you have this possibility of participating in the life of God. And so the idea most, let's say, even at the early stages of Christianity, you know, people like Justin Martyr talked about how uh, Socrates, how Plato were Christians before Christ in the sense that they, they participated in the life of the logos. And so it's not a strange thing for Christians to believe that Christianity is kind of the, is, is, is a culmination of this story. And so it's all religions somehow participate in that story. Hmm. And you, you've said before, just before we started recording, that you think this is where this conversation needs to go. I mean, I've, I've got a sense of there's, a, there's either a, an expansion of the word atheist to, to say, okay, Atheism doesn't mean believing in a God outside of space and time, creating something, but it could mean an imminent, an in, imminent creative principle that, that doesn't need to have a sort of religious substructure. Do you not think that's possible? Well, I think that the first thing that needs to happen is I think that atheism needs to grapple with classical theism, needs to grapple not with kind of modern visions of uh, kind of modern evangelical or modern fundamentalist thinking, but needs to grapple with a more profound mystical vision of theism, which is that it's not so much that we understand God as this being that's outside of the world who created it. And almost like he's just, just this very, very big invisible being who creates the world. That is not what, what uh, traditional Christians believe. They, they believe that God is transcends all of creation because he's the source of all manifestation. He's the, he's the source of everything that happens, but he's also within, he's also the root 
let's say the, the ground of being, you would say, he's the root of all things that as they appear. And then he's also hidden in each aspect of manifestation. And so the logos is the purpose of things or the logos of things is hidden in all, all manifestation without a center, without a purpose, without a logos, the world uh, doesn't exist. And that's where we get into this idea of uh, attention and the notion of, uh, you know, the, this notion of salience and, and this new kind of consciousness science, which, which notices how in order for us to perceive something, we, there needs to be kind of this coming together. And this, you know, these, these uh, you know, like for me to perceive a microphone, there's some strange magical thing which needs me, makes me capable of perceiving that all the parts of the microphone somehow cohere into something which is above all its parts. That's actually a description of something that uh, Saint Light, Saint Maximus would talk about, that hidden in all manifestations at all level is, are these hidden sparks, these hidden purposes that human consciousness engages with and the human being becomes the laboratory into which all of these things come together. We're kind of co-creators. We participate in the existence of the world through, through, through our capacity for logos and reason and, and consciousness. And in that conception, is, is God identified with the totality of everything or is it? it no, God, God, is, God, has to, God has to both transcend everything, but then also underlie everything. And so it's not, you, the problem with talking about God as a totality of everything is, a, is that it's, it's kind of like this quantitative thing. It's almost like you take the entire universe and that would be God. But then how does that also come? How does everything come into one? How can you even say everything? And so above that everything appears this infinite, non-sayable, unmentionable uh, possibility, which is, you know, the, the divine essence or, you know, the, the, the I, I always say the infinite is the best way to, to talk about it. And that's the highest vision of God in a kind of traditional theistic way, in a, a vision. And how do you think this conversation should move on? Well, I think, I think that there are two things. First is exploring the place of consciousness. And I really would wish, I, I really wished, and I think I've said this to you before, I really wish that, that Sam and, and Jordan, when they talk, could have talked more about consciousness because the the this notion that the world kind of um that consciousness participates in the way the world lays itself out and that's our primary interface let's say with the world before science let's say that science comes second the first interface we have with the world is this phenomenological reality of of encountering the world and so plunging into that is what's going to help people understand what religion is talking about. And it also help people to demystify some of the language that religion uses um, because it's taking that point of view as being the first point of view. And so, you know, like I always tell people, it's like, no matter what you say, the sun still rises in the morning and it still goes up into the, into the sky and it sets at night. And that's actually the most important part that the sun has for you because that's how you settle your day. That's how you, your whole life is structured around the fact that the sun gets up in the morning. And so that reality, that phenomenological reality is primary. Science actually comes second. Uh, and I think that that's, and, and if you plunge into that phenomenological reality and the way the world lays itself out, then all of a sudden, let's say rituals of centeredness, rituals of, of uh, things like communion, things like uh, sacred spaces will start to make sense because you'll see that without those, things start to fragment and, and, and fall apart. And that's what we're seeing in society today. And so I think that that's, consciousness is the key. And then also really going past this idea that religion is just a bunch of things that people need to do, that, it, that although there, it is part of religion, but to understand how it is, it is really a language and a way of being which, which participates in the existence of reality that it, it's a very ancient understanding of how it is that things can be both multiple and one at the same time and how that actually happens. I think I'd probably share with you a sense that what's needed is, is certainly a, a renewal of a lot of values that we've lost and a lot of the, the sacred. I have a sense that you would like to see a renewal of Christianity. 
would that be be right or do you think that we need a new some kind of new spiritual or religious tradition that that kind of because I, I i can't really see like a, a real renewal of christianity happening well all i can say is i think that it's very difficult to change the story we're in um i think that the chore the story will change there are some things which are kind of you could say providential in the sense that there are these these historical patterns that you can't change. You can't you can't just decide that you're going to now let's say start a new spirituality. You can do that. People have done that. We've seen it happen in the 20th century, you know, millions of times, and it's participated in the fragmentation of Western society. Uh, I think that to me, until until the big change, until the massive shift, you know, until what Christians kind of call the, the return of Christ or this moment where everything's going to, going to change. And we don't know what that looks like. It's a, it's an imagistic uh, story about, you know, the, the, this thing that happens in the world, which changes everything until that, I think that to stay inside the story is the best, is the best bet for us now. Uh, and, and all the efforts that have been put to, to do something else have been uh, subversive in my opinion. Mm. And what does that mean, staying inside the story? Well, that means that means staying inside the Christian story, you know, for all its for all its uh, messiness and for all its kind of uh, dimming and it's kind of approaching a sunset. Uh, I don't think that there's another story, at least for Western culture right now. Um, I think that the two stories for Western culture have been Christianity and Judaism, and I think that those those are there, and and they're not they're they're, they're not they're not going away until something massive happens. Um, and so, and I know a lot of people might think that's odd that I would say that, but I think that that it's when you start to understand that things unfold in these patterns. And in a way we, we have very little individual control over how those things unfold. And we're playing out, let's say the Christian story right now in the Christian story, there is a, a breaking apart. It's part of the story. There is a death. It's, the death of Christianity is part of the Christian story. And so we're kind of going through that right now. And I think it's, it's inevitable. Um, and I respect people, and I totally respect people who, who would say in the light of that, that I would rather do my own thing, for, let's say. I, I understand that. I respect that. But I, but I don't see another, another true viable path, let's say, for the West besides that. Hmm. That might be depressing for people to hear. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, that's a very live conversation among a lot of people I speak to, the need for a the grand narrative. What is the grand narrative? Is there the possibility of resurrecting a grand narrative? Um, I, I have to say I'm skeptical that that can be Christianity given the fact that we have sort of seemed to have decisively left it behind. At least um, we're a lot less religious, I think, in the UK than you guys. Well, you're not in the States, but in North yeah. America at least. Yeah. Um, but I, th I think that that is the key question. It's like, what does the grand narrative look like? How do we recover some of these timeless truths and can it be done within a context that um, looks different from how it's been done in the past, but it will have a lot in common with it. I mean, it will have to have a lot in common with it. But then again, I also come back to the fact that Christianity has accreted this immense depth and wisdom over such a long period of time that the idea that we can sort of come up with something off the cuff seems pretty unrealistic at the same time. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think that that's why I talk about kind of providence. People won't understand what I mean by that. But in the sense that something has to happen. It's, it's, not, it's not just like, uh, it's really not just that we can decide to change the, the story. There, there is something, there's a deep shift that needs to, to occur for the story to change. And it's something that we, as individuals, uh, just as individuals, we can participate in that shift, but as individuals, we don't have that much power to actually affect, you know, this, this story that's, that's going on. Um, so that's kind of how I, I see it. And I think what's going to happen, I think that if I want to come back to the, to the, the problem of, um, of Brett and the problem of where the discussion needs to go, one of the, one of the difficulties that we, the reason why I also wanted to go back to consciousness is because there is I think in the way that Brett talks about it, and this is what I brought up in our discussion the first time we talked, is, is that he takes for granted the position. Like he takes for granted his moral landscape. He, he thinks it's obvious that 
we should act in certain ways. Um, and, and he doesn't have, he doesn't have a, uh, he just takes it for granted. We don't know what the source of that is. Um, we don't know what the source of his direction is. He, he says he's a liberal. He's obviously left-leaning. And so it seems to come from that side, let's say. Um, but there's another side, right? There's another side, which is the, the, the right wing. And those right wing people also have their, their um, let's say, their priorities. And so to think that it's just obvious, it's not. If it was obvious, there wouldn't be this clash and there wouldn't be this discussion. Uh, it, it isn't obvious. And so unless we do find a common narrative, then those two opposites, like I, I've been saying forever, are just going to manifest themselves again. And we're going to have the same clash we had, you know, at the beginning of the modern age. You know, r right now we're just surfing. We're just surfing, let's say, the, it's horrible to say that we're kind of, we're kind of surfing the Holocaust. Like the Holocaust was such a shock, uh, you know, that we're kind of, we're, we're still in awe from that. And we're just, we're just kind of, surfing the end of that wave and we're reaching the end of what that that's a shock could could afford us and now we're once again seeing the same same story happen again uh and and unless unless people find a a a grounding and the grounding isn't just a bunch of morality like i said but it really is this rediscovering the notion of what makes a center what makes what makes something exist what is you know, how does time work? How does consciousness engage with the world? I asked before where you think this conversation goes. I, I was kind of thinking about the sense that Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson had these very public events that uh, went some distance, but didn't go as far as some people hoped in terms of coming to a bit of a, a conclusion or pushing the debate forward enough. Who do you think are the right people to be having those kind of debates to push it forward? Well, I think that, I think that the discussion that Jordan had with Ben, I think that those are the, the discussions that are going to attract a lot of attention because they're, di they're diving into the, the crux of the matter in terms of how do we find a coherent set of values and how do we establish, uh, you know, how do we establish something which is coherent? Like how do we bring things together? So I think that that's why that, that conversation attracted a lot of attention. And I think that that's the, the future. I think that the fact that you're talking, you know, on your channel that you're talking to like Zen masters and you're talking to people that are both in the, let's say in the secular world, but are also engaged in uh, religious traditions. I think that that's the best way to go about. There's a, there's a fear that I have in terms of this intellectual dark web uh, phenomena is that it's kind of cantonizing itself where you basically have all, uh, kind of secular atheist types. And then you have Ben Shapiro, who's kind of like the, the exception. So, so I think that if we broaden the discussion to involve more, more people, like uh, Dave Rubin is talking to uh, uh, Bishop Barron from California, who's, a, who's an excellent person who really understands uh, kind of Christian ontology and the metaphysics of Christianity. Those types of discussion, I think, widening it out so that, so that there is more of this discussion between the more rationalists and the scientists and uh, kind of spiritual tradition. I think, I think that that's the key to, to coming to something that has more, uh, more depth, let's say. Because I guess that's the point I was, I was thinking about is that, I mean, even with, with Ben Shapiro and um, Jordan Peterson, they're both coming from religious tradition. So it's not like, I guess what I'm saying is where's the open-minded um, religious person and the open-minded atheist that can come together and, and one could potentially change the other's mind and come to some kind of synthesis that maybe Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris weren't able to come to. Well, I think you'd be surprised. I think that, <clears throat> I think that there are quite like people like uh, Paul Vanderclay, for example, is someone who there are some things that he won't budge on. Let's say some, some basic tenets that he won't, I don't think he would budge on, but you know, like even myself, I came into this discussion with Jordan, you know, several years ago, thinking that science was not, <laughs> let's say not in not particularly appreciating the way that science was totalizing the discourse and and feeling like like they were missing out on on you know the the highest thing and so then in my discussion through jordan i've discovered uh the science of consciousness i've discovered you know how evolutionary uh psychology can talk about these things in different with different angles and so i felt like my position has changed quite a bit in appreciating let's say uh 
the role that scientific inquiry can play right now. And so I think that there's quite a, people, quite a few people that actually would be able to have these discussions. The, the, the question is also, one of the problems with it, the intellectual dark web right now is that it's also a high profile game where it's only people who have a certain, uh, let's say, visibility that are able to have the high level discussions. And it's not always the case that those who have the highest visibility are the ones who are the most interesting and the most, um, let's say, proficient in what they're supposed to, in what they're talking about. So let's, um, so who else should our audience be checking out? Well, I think that people who want to kind of, let's say at least understand Christianity, I think that Bishop Barron is someone who is definitely interesting. There's a writer, his name is David Bentley Hart. I think that a lot of, he's a bit, he's a bit abrasive because he doesn't like new atheists, but he does talk about, um, he, he wrote a book recently called Experiencing God, which talks about the relationship between consciousness and our experience of the divine and how the, the, those two are structured alike. Um, and th so there are writers like that. David Lee Hart is definitely someone I would encourage people to look into. Great. Jonathan, it's been a real pleasure again speaking to you. All right. Until next time. Thanks. Until next time.